Well, hey, today I want to talk about going on vacation. Yeah, but I want to talk about going on vacation from God. I wonder if you've ever done this, if you've ever experienced that. It is vacation season, or at least it's coming up right around the corner, and I know that many of us are looking forward to a break in the schedule as we get through May and school kind of gets behind us, and maybe some of the the, the busyness of the season sort of begins to change. Maybe some of us are looking forward to heading to the beach. We're getting out of town, going to the mountains, going on road trips, whatever it may be. I know that it's that season and we're beginning to think about those things. And that got me thinking about some of the funny memes I've seen on the internet about family vacation and road trips with the kids. Uh, this is pretty telling right here. Uh, me thinking a road trip with kids will be fun. Yeah, this will be fun. Ten minutes into the trip, I'm crying and I'm 40 years older than when we started. Uh, here's another one. Uh, here's a child laughing, and then they expected me to sleep in the car seat. Ha, ha, ha. Really enjoying that joke. How about this one? Okay, this one might be a little hard to read. This is, this is mama, uh, mama Dog saying, we just pulled out of the rest stop. And the puppy saying, I didn't have to go then. <laughs> have you ever experienced this, parents? You, you have felt this pain. Here's another one. How about this one? <laughs> My parents fighting on the road trip as the house burns down in the background, in the foreground, there's the child who instigated it, right? Like they just sort of light the match, throw it in there, and then we take care of the rest, right? Right, moms and dads? All right, what else we got? How about this one? I love this kid's face. Cry all flight long and then fall asleep during landing. Mm, that may be too soon for some of us. I mean, we've experienced this recently. How about this one? This will get us all uh, on the bus, so to speak. It doesn't matter how old you are. Buying snacks for a road trip should always look like an unsupervised nine-year-old was given $100. Am I right? Like, that's just, yes, that is just true. We should all be able to do that. You know, we have some funny beliefs about vacation, kind of like our, our friend Bob Wiley. If you uh, remember the movie, What About Bob? He goes on a vacation from his problems, right? Like, and we've all wished that we could do that. But the reality is often we, we do go on vacation from things in our lives. Some of them are healthy habits, right? Like we go on vacation from healthy eating, and we just think calories don't count when we're on vacation, you know, whether it's eating, drinking, spending, for some reason, why is it that, or is it just me, that we think when we're on vacation, that money just doesn't, it doesn't come out of your account, you know? Like, and I don't know, that, that people figured this out. This is why there are outlet malls at, you know, the beach and at the mountains and at pretty much wherever you go, there's a place for you to go shopping because you just must have these things that are on sale here and nowhere else, and you must have them, and you end up coming back with more than you went with. The reality is we can even vacation from God. We get out of healthy habits of reading the Bible and praying and connecting with God, even gathering like right here with the people of God. We leave God at home with our Bible on the coffee table. Like he'll be there when we get back as if we didn't need him while we were on vacation. This summer, my challenge to you is this. Don't vacation from God. Just because it's travel season does not mean it's the off season for following Jesus. New seasons are great. I love new seasons. I'm looking forward to this new season. This is my last Sunday here before I go on sabbatical. So I'm very excited, and I'm thinking about this. It's very relevant for me. I'm kind of wondering, you know, because I sort of follow Jesus professionally, I guess, you know, and I'm like, when I don't have to do that, when I don't have to study God's word, when I don't have to prepare something to be able to serve to you, Will I follow Jesus? Or will I vacation from him? What does it look like to follow Jesus this summer? Who do you want to continue becoming as we head into this new season? Those questions are relevant as we look at the question Jesus asks today. We've been 
looking at different questions that Jesus asked people over 2,000 years ago. These were real questions he was asking to real people with real stories and real fears and real doubts, real questions. He's still asking these questions to us today. The question that Jesus asks us is, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I tell you? It's a pointed question. This question comes at the end of a section in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 6. It's often called the Sermon on the Plain. Perhaps you've heard of the Sermon on the Mount, which is in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's chapters 5, 6, and 7. And there are some similarities to these two sermons, but there's also some significant differences. And there are a couple of theories on this. Number one, some people think they record the same sermon, but Matthew and Luke are just giving summaries of different sections with different emphases. Others believe that Matthew and Luke are recording two different sermons given on different occasions, but repeating much of the same content, just like traveling preachers often do. Either way, the point of the message here that we're going to see in Luke chapter 6 is that Jesus wants to make it abundantly clear what his followers look like. He's saying, in effect, if you're going to become a citizen of my kingdom, if you're going to be a true disciple or learner or follower, this is what will be true of you. So today I want to look at what people were doing in this passage, and then I want to look at what Jesus is saying and then make four observations that will be true of anyone who considers themselves to be a follower of Jesus, whether you're on vacation or not. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn to Luke chapter 6 or pull that up on an app in your smartphone, I'm going to begin with verse 17. And he, Jesus, came down with them, the disciples, and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came near to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and he healed them all. First thing I want to point out is this. Followers of Jesus prioritize hearing from Jesus. Everyone had gathered around to hear him. They came a long way to hear him. They chose to hear Jesus over whatever else was going on in their lives. What does it look like to prioritize hearing from Jesus in our lives? And especially as we enter into the summer season. One of the primary ways that Jesus speaks to us is through his word. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is breathed out by God. This is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, the scriptures breathed out the very words of God speaking to each one of us. Do you have a healthy habit of reading God's word? The Bible tells us it's nourishing to our souls. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 that we can't live by bread alone. Man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Last week when we looked at that scene where Jesus and Peter were having breakfast on the beach after Jesus had rose from the dead and And he's restoring his relationship with Peter and restoring Peter's purpose. And you remember Jesus said to him, do you love me? Feed my sheep. This is what he's talking about. Feed them with his very word. The prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament said, your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart as I began to consume them and they 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 were digested and, and then giving nourishment and energy to my soul. These are your words. They became joy and a delight. Why is it so important that we have a steady diet of reading and studying and chewing on the words of God? 
Well, I love what Dane Ortland writes in his book, Gentle and Lowly. I have a few quotes. He writes, we picture the risen Christ approaching us with a severe and sour disposition, as Puritan Thomas Goodwin says. This is why we need a Bible. Our natural intuition can only give us a God like us. Here's another one. I better go quick. He says the Bible is one long attempt to deconstruct our natural vision of who God actually is. Hmm. And then here's the last one. Perhaps Satan's greatest victory in your life today is not the sin in which you regularly indulge, but the dark thoughts of God's heart that cause you to go there in the first place and then keep you cool toward him in the wake of it. I hope what you're picking up from those three quotes is that we have a very skewed picture of who God is, and that's why he has given us his word to reveal himself as he truly is, and we need him to open our eyes to see him. It's why I pray that prayer every Sunday that I stand here. I pray that prayer every morning when I sit down to read this. God, show me who you are so that I don't have this picture of you coming to me with a sour mood, discouraged and frustrated and unhappy with me. I need to see Jesus as the friend of sinners who never abandons us. This is why we need to prioritize this because God speaks to us and tells us who he is. We need to carve out time and space to be still and quiet, to be able to read and then ask the question, Lord, what are you saying to me right now? So let me ask you, do you have a plan? Do you have a plan for reading God's word? Because if you're anything like me, I gotta have a plan. If I wake up in the morning and I don't have a plan, I just, I mean, this is a big book. There's a lot of things in there, some, some confusing and complicating things. Where do I even begin? Where do I start? Do I just do the whole Bible roulette thing, you know? Just let it fall open and put your finger there and then see if the Lord has something to say to you. I just do better with a plan, and I bet you do as well, which is why we have a reading plan. You can get one out at the starting point table. You can find it on our social media. You can even go out on our mobile app and you can find it. Get a plan so that you have a, a trail to follow. Here's another question. Once you have that plan, do you have a method of how you will read God's word? Do you have something that's been working for you? Do you need something new? Do you need to, to spice it up, freshen it up a little bit as you get back into a healthy habit? Let me give you one really simple way to do this. When you sit down with God's word, practice the SOAP method, S-O-A-P. S stands for scripture. Pick a verse out of what you read and write it down. Then O means make some observations. Observe what's going on here. Is, it, is this a story? Is this a poem? Is Jesus speaking? Is it, who is speaking? What's happening here? Move to the A, which is application. Is there something here that I'm being called to do or to not do, to trust God with? And then finally, the P is pray. Pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom in this, to give you the strength and the power or the courage that, that you're going to need to walk this out, to apply this. But know this, the goal of reading your Bible is not to check a box. The goal is not completion, although I know some of you love to crush goals. The goal ultimately is connection with your God building and strengthening your relationship with him, receiving instruction and guidance and wisdom and learning who Jesus is and how to follow him. So don't take the summer off. Don't take the rest of this week off now that you've been to church. Don't take off because it's busy right now. Your soul needs this. Here's the second thing I wanna point out in Luke chapter six. It's right here in these same verses. Followers of Jesus not only prioritize hearing from Jesus, they also desire to experience Jesus. Right there in verses 18 and 19, the, the crowds came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. All the crowd sought to touch him, 
for power came out from him. They all wanted a firsthand encounter with the miraculous power of God. They came wanting to have their own God story. They didn't just want to hear about the stories that other people have had. They wanted their own story. Where in your life do you need the power of God? Maybe it's in your marriage. You know, maybe, maybe that relationship feels like it's on life support. Or maybe it's just strained right now. Some things have kind of been stirred up to the surface because of whatever's going on in life. And, and you need God to do something powerful there. Maybe there's some vice, a sin in your life that's just got a grip on you. It could be a battle with pornography or alcohol, prescription pills could be overeating, could be overspending, could be a critical and judgmental heart toward others, and you feel helpless in this fight, no matter how hard you try, so you need Jesus to display his power in this. Maybe there's a loved one who's bent on rejecting Jesus. You see how hard their heart is to spiritual things and you wonder if it'll ever be possible for their lives to change. You need Jesus to display his power in their lives. Maybe your finances are strained. Maybe something's going on with your kids that just feels so beyond your ability to help, so far out of your control. You need Jesus to do something. Followers of Jesus want and need to experience Jesus. And so we come to him with these things. And we come to him believing that he is able and willing to do something. So let me give you three ways that we can come to him. Number one, commit to prayer. Commit to praying. Not just pray once, but, but persevere in this and continue to pray. What is it that's going on right now in your life? What's not well? What's What's out of alignment? Will you commit to praying for that? Let me ask you this. If you got everything you prayed for today, what would be different? It's a convicting question for me. I struggle to persevere in prayer. I might pray about something once and then I'm just sort of move on. There is stuff going on in my life that I'm not praying for. But I long to see Jesus do something. Let's commit to prayer. Here's the second thing. Embrace humility. Here's what I mean by that. Believe that nothing is beneath you. Sharing with your life group, even if it's scary and embarrassing. Going to counseling. Walking up and talking to the pastor or to someone who's sitting around you about the things that God is stirring in your heart. Admitting fault. Apologizing. Asking for forgiveness. Asking for help. That's not a sign of weakness. Don't let your pride get in the way of experiencing Jesus. Embrace humility. And here's the third way we can come to him. Put yourself in a place where Jesus tends to show up. People who experience the power of Jesus tend to put themselves in places where Jesus shows up. So go to elder prayer when they gather the first Sunday of the month to, to pray over the sick and those who need healing. Go to our monthly prayer night, the first Tuesday of every month. There are people who are gathering to worship and to pray and to call upon the name of Jesus for whatever may be going on. Go to life group and be honest. Fight for unhurried time in your daily routine. Or take a step of obedience, a, a, a scary step that's going to require 
your faith in him, and it's going to require him to show up. Jesus tends to show up in these places. Do you show up there? Followers of Jesus prioritize hearing from Jesus. They desire to experience Jesus. And followers of Jesus are shaped by Jesus. You know, it's, it's not enough to just want to, to hear what he might have to say or to even you know, get, maybe get close enough to have some of his power sort of rub off on us and change our circumstances. We have to go f- further to becoming shaped by him. And that predominantly happens by his teaching. We need to look at what Jesus was saying here in this sermon. I'm going to read a few sections of it. They're not going to be on the screen. So if you want to follow along in Luke chapter 6 on your app you can, or your Bible, you can do that. But I don't have time to unpack it all. I just want to give you the big idea. And the big idea is this. Jesus is redefining the world. He's turning the world upside down. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be a citizen in my kingdom, you need to know that I operate radically different from anyone or anything else in this world. So he says things like in verse 20, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. He's saying on account of me. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Jesus is saying, you might feel marginalized right now. Perhaps you don't have everything you want right now. Perhaps life isn't going the way you planned right now. But there's a day that is coming when you will be satisfied. There's a day coming when you will laugh with great joy. There's a day coming when you'll experience a reward far greater than anything you could receive or experience in this life. But, he goes on to say, Woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you when all the people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Jesus flips it. He says, if you've got it made right now, you know, You're winning in this world right now. If you're looking to this world for your satisfaction, watch out. Because there is more to life than what you can get out of this world. Over the next 10 verses, Jesus says things like, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. He says, give to everyone who begs of you. He says, love people who will not love you back. That's the stuff that begins to distinguish true followers of Jesus from those who just want to hear from him or experience his power, but not necessarily follow him. Followers of Jesus are shaped by Jesus, which means his desires start to become our desires. Our convictions about what is right and wrong, what is true and what is false, they're shaped by his teaching and his convictions. Our mission and our purpose in life is being shaped by his purpose and his mission. This is called the discipleship process. It's also called sanctification. We call it transformation around here. Looking more and more like a citizen of a different kind of kingdom. Looking more and more like Jesus. So let me ask you this question. In what ways are you being shaped by Jesus right now? be truly shaped by Jesus, we need the final observation we're going to make today. Followers of Jesus are fully surrendered to Jesus. After Jesus has 
healed the sick. He's taught these radical things about life in his kingdom and what a follower looks like. He then asks this question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? You must have understood that there were some people who, who were gathering around and listening, perhaps has even, have even heard him speak and have experienced his power on a number of occasions, but continue to, to not live out what he's saying. That word Lord, it's used over 700 times in the New Testament. It's an important word. It means master, owner, supreme in authority. And when you use it twice in a row like this, like Jesus will sometimes say like, truly, truly, I tell you. He's doubling down. It's really important. It demonstrates passion and conviction. He's saying, you guys are gathering around. You're like, Lord, Lord, yes, you, master. But you don't do anything that I say. When Jesus conquered our sin on the cross and then conquered death when he walked out of that tomb, God the Father exalted him above every ruler and every power in the world. He gave him the name that is above every name. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's not just a savior, he's a king. But we don't always want a king, do we? We want a strong kingdom economy. We want a good kingdom defense, but with as much autonomy as possible. And Jesus is like, why do you call me Lord, but don't do what I say? To be a true follower of Jesus is to live under the lordship of Jesus. To live a life that is surrendered to Jesus. A life full of obedience to Jesus. A life that understands that partial obedience or selective obedience is disobedience. Parents, we get this, right? When our kids sort of choose what they're going to do, what we've said, that's disobedience. They come to us, dad, dad, mom, I love you. Will you give me a whatever? And you're like, oh, now, now you love me. Why haven't you done what I've said? Now Jesus tells them a parable about this. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house, but it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. I want you to notice something in both these situations. The stream's going to rise. The stream's going to rise no matter what. Whether you're building your life on the foundation of Jesus' words or not, the stream's going to rise. The question is, will your house still be there? It's not enough to hear Jesus. It's not even about just agreeing with Jesus. It's about obeying Jesus. Later on in Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus was speaking to everyone who, would, who had gathered around him. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is what fully surrendering to Jesus looks like, self-denial. It's about learning how to say no to ourselves. Saying no when you want to say or do something that is of this world. That's not what a citizen of this new kingdom would do or say. It's saying no, that's not what God wants me to do. It's saying, Jesus, you're the king. What do you want me to do today? Oh, you want me to go across the street and knock on my neighbor's door and begin to tell them about my faith and my church family and 
maybe invite them over to dinner, potentially put myself up for rejection. I don't really want to do that. But if that's what you want me to do. Oh, you want me to tell someone the truth about this thing that I've kind of buried, tucked away, hoping no one would notice. God, I don't want to do that. But if that's what you want. A good test of this might be to ask ourselves the question, when was the last time I did not want to do something, but I knew God wanted me to do it, so I did it? When was the last time I didn't want to do something, but I knew God wanted me to do it, so I did it? That's when you know he's Lord. How do you make decisions about what car to drive? What house to buy? What job to take? Is it like everybody else? Is, ooh, I want that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not sinful. I'm getting it. Or do you submit that? Do you surrender that to Jesus? Lord, I really want this job. Lord, I really want this truck. But it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. It's about what's best for your kingdom. So, will you lead me in that? Followers of Jesus prioritize hearing from Jesus. They desire to experience the power of Jesus. They're shaped by Jesus and his teaching. And they fully surrender to Jesus. So what? Recently, I was listening to an author and pastor named Francis Chan. You may have heard of him. He wrote a famous book called Crazy Love. And he was talking about uh, his time living in India. And while he was there, he would encounter uh, a number of Christians. And he was just hearing story after story after story of people making incredible sacrifices and surrendering to Jesus. It was just blowing him away. It was just like every Christian he met was, had this same story of sacrifice and surrender. And so finally he went up to a guy and he was just like, man, I, I just, I gotta know. Like, like every story I've heard is this power, this powerful story of sacrifice. Like are there any people here that just sort of casually believe in God? And the guy said, that's really not an option here. When we get baptized, we lose everything. We lose our families. We lose our jobs. We lose our status. Why would anyone casually do that? Because we live in a free country and we experience a different kind of level of wealth and affluence here, even in our own community. It's almost like we think differently about our salvation. It's like there's no immediate cost that's been forced upon us. So we have to really challenge ourselves to reflect. Jesus, are you really the Lord of my life? Are you really calling the shots? Am I really living out this radical teaching? Am I listening for your voice to guide me? What area of your life is Jesus looking at and asking, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord and yet you are He's not trying to condemn you. He's not asking that question to shame you or condemn you. He's trying to save you. He's trying to save you from living for a dying kingdom. He's trying to save you from settling for immediate temporary gains. He's trying to save us from selfish, fearful, unforgiving, bitter lives. 
I just wonder what this church family and this community might look like if every person that were gathered here today would just begin to take God's word, read it, ask the spirit of God to empower us to do it, and then we just did what it said. What might happen? What might change in our lives and in the lives of the people around us? Imagine if we really committed to prayer, like we just continued to bang on God's door about these things that we long to see him change. Pleading with him to experience his nearness, his healing, his power. Imagine if we truly surrendered our lives and we gave him the keys to every area of our lives. We didn't hold anything back. We said, Lord, not my will, but yours. This summer, what do you want to see God do? Who do you want to become? Will you prioritize hearing from him? Put yourself in places where you can experience his nearness and his power. Be willing to let his teaching shape you by surrendering and obeying whatever he says. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I just want to take a moment because I feel like we need to ask or at least look at the question Jesus asks us. Why? Why don't we do what you say? I pray that you would speak to us. Maybe our why is We don't want to leave what's comfortable. Maybe our why is that we're afraid. If we step out in obedience, we really lean into these things that you say, you might leave us hanging. won't show up. Maybe our why is that we just don't really know what it is you're calling us to because we have not really prioritized this. We've sort of taken a break from you. I just pray you would graciously put your finger on that why to help us know ourselves, to understand what's holding us back. And then I pray that we would sense the forgiveness and cleansing that can be found in our Savior Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, so that we can, with renewed spirits, say, okay, Lord, not what I want, but what you want. What are you saying to me today? Pray that we would have ears to hear your voice calling us back to you. Not in any way to earn your love, but to experience it and enjoy it. Pray that you would give us the courage that we need to obey you, to fully surrender to you. Pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.